each and every one of us as he speaks this morning. Bless him, Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Super. Okay, this is good. Yes, Lord. This is sort of a sermon that you want to preach on Mother's Day. <laughs> and that notice my wife strategically is not here. <laughs> oh, God is good. Amen. God is good. All right, well, so let's get into it. So basically, uh, I said to the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to preach on for the next period? And he said, um, I, want you to, I want you to do an Old Testament book. And, uh, and, and, I, and I thought, well, I mean, I preached on most of them. I preached on all of them at some stage. But I preached on them in different ways. And, but I've never really, thanks, Bob. I've never really um, got into the book of <clears throat> Esther in terms of really studying it. And, uh, you know, just, I've just kind of operated on a sort of bird's eye view. Oh, yeah, I remember that happened. Oh, yeah, that happened. Oh, yeah. And I never really got into it. And uh, so it's been a real blessing to me to uh, study, uh, properly study, not, uh, you know, memory study, but properly study this book. Because it's been, uh, it's been a, a real um, eye-opener, uh, a fresh to my heart, which is really, is, you know. So if I didn't do it for anyone else other than me, it's been a blessing. But I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> really glad you're here. So... Phil's read, and he read really well. We say thank you to Phil for reading. He does that great. Um, you, you know, there is a sense in which how he pronounces people's names. What he doesn't realise is I took out about 13 names. Um, uh, anyway, I thought there's no point in him saying that. So I just gave him that. So you'll find in your Bible a, num a number of other people, but you don't remember them, and I, I can't even talk and speak them. So, you know. So, let's go. Babylon was defeated by the Medes and the Persians. So we had King Nebuchadnezzar, and he basically was, as it were, the kingpin. He was the one guy that was really pulling the shots. But even after Nebuchadnezzar had gone and various different things uh, happened, um, the Medes and the Persians basically took over Babylon. They, they took over the empire, and now they're, they're the ruling party. And uh, so, so that's the, that's the kind of historical reality of it. There are only two books in the Bible named after women. Would you believe? Only two books in the Bible. Uh, Ruth and Esther. Uh, <clears throat> God's, uh, his name is not in any of the ten chapters of Esther. There's not, you won't find God in it. You won't find the name God in it in, in any way. Um, but uh, unlike King Ahasuerus, I've called him, right? you called him what you like, I've called him uh, uh, Ahasuerus. Excellent. Okay. Do what you like. <laughs> this geezer, he's mentioned, this king, he's mentioned 175 times. So this guy's like, you know, he, he wants his name recorded. Um, so God is not mentioned, uh, but King Hazarus, he's mentioned 175 times. <laughs> Having been in captivity, the Jews, to, to the Babylonians, the Jews uh, were released to go and, as it were, populate the provinces. And they were invited to go back, after Daniel this was, and they were invited to go back, having been in captivity for 70 years. Now, some of them did go back to Israel, to Jerusalem, but many of them didn't. Many of them stayed in, the, in Susa, but many of them stayed in the provinces. And they made their new lives. They stayed in the provinces. And they were serving, in effect, as part of the culture, now the Medes and the Persians. And the story of Esther is set outside of the land of Israel. It's set in Susa, the capital. And so you've got this situation where... Most of the time, when people write about the Jews, it's within their land. But this is going on outside of their land. They're, they're, they're in a kind of democracy captivity. So why did so many of the Jews stay in Babylon? 
They had been given permission to return to their own land. Why did they stay? If you had the opportunity to be released and to be set free and to go back to the beginning, why wouldn't you? Well, there was a good reason. What was going on in terms of the lifestyle in, 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 in Babylon, in Susa, was it was all happening. It was a happening place. It was where everything rocked and rolled. Back in Jerusalem, the, the walls were down, the city was broken down, the, the temple was broken down, uh, people were living off the earth. It was chaos, there was no order, it was all, it was just like, um, like, like, like after the war, when you had all these bomb sites everywhere, those of you who remember after the war. <laughs> and so it wasn't worth going back to. And having built businesses, and that's what the Jewish nation is very good at, building businesses, having built business in the communities and part of the land, they, they, they didn't want to go back. They didn't want to let go of hot and cold running water. They, 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 they liked the privileges that had established. They, they liked the prominence. There was lots of people that didn't want to go back, even though some did return. The Jewish nation has learned to succeed in adversary all through history. They are the oldest nation, you know, absolutely unique nation. They are, and they, 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 they succeed wherever they are. They're survivors and they succeed in adversary. Being in captab, captivity under Nebuchadnezzar was no different. They, they, they're survivors, they made their way through. Oh, what about you, are you a survivor? The word assimilated means to merge into a culture in order to protect oneself from persecution by behaving just like everyone else. And uh, when I was think preparing this, I wanted to sing that song, Come, a, come, a, come, a, come, a chameleon. Because mm. a chameleon is something that basically becomes as it were, accustomed to wherever it is in terms of colorization, to protect itself from danger. And this assimilated, uh, this word assimilated, to merge into a culture in order to protect oneself from persecution by behaving just like everyone else. I wonder, are Christians today in danger of doing the same where there's no distinction between those who are Christians and those <coughs> who are not. Now the purpose of this letter was to remember, we had Remembrance Sunday last week, to remember and it's right to remember because as soon as we forget we begin to reproduce the mistakes of the past. And it's important that we remember, lest we find ourselves repeating history. And this book is written in order to remember the great deliverance and the great salvation that God brought to the people of Israel in their suffering and in their persecution, or at least their anticipated suffering and persecution. God's deliverance to his people. And you see that again and again and again in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Now the author of the book is unknown. The author of the book is unknown. So we can't give any detail except to speculate. But I always think, what's the point of speculating if it isn't the truth, if you don't know? So I'll leave that to you. But no one knows who the author of the book is. Now, the characters in the story, and it is a story, it's a story that's like an epic story. The characters in the story, I'll give you a list. They're Mordecai, the Jewish uncle. There's Haman, the Agai. He's the baddie. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> He's the baddie, uh, Haman. Um, and then you've got 
uh, keen as a, 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 you put me off there, James. A sesamus, <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> the king, we call him the king. We got the king. He's the ruler of these 127 provinces. And then you've got Queen Esther, who was from the tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the tribes of the Israel nation. And then you've got Queen Vasti, or Vasti, the rebellious wife. And you've got this plot building up amongst the characters in the book. So you've got King... King. <laughs> He's motivated at a celebration to show off Queen Vasti. She's the prize heifer. And he wants to show her off. And so he wants to do everything he can possible to promote her to everyone at the banquet. To say to everyone at the banquet, banquet <coughs> look what I've got, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Look what I've got. He's wanted to tell all of the people, look what I've got. Now, that tells you a lot about the man. The fact that he's recorded 175 times in the 10 chapters is an incredible thing anyway. So I don't know if he has something to do with writing the story. But... <laughs> The reality is, you start to see the character of the man and his need to promote his prize ever in front of everyone. And he's got this, um, this issue, uh, the fact that he needed to be acknowledged in that way, I believe is an indication of his insecurity. <clears throat> and the, now the reality is, most leaders are actually very insecure people. They are but they're there with a conviction to lead. Leadership is an anointing. There is natural things in, in, in humanity, but there is an anointing. Most leaders are insecure. This king, he's insecure. And he needs constantly to be reassured and reminded that he is the top dog. So there's a goodie in the story and a baddie. There's the righteous and the wicked. The story is so powerfully written, it could be made into an epic film. <clears throat> there is an introduction building up to a climax of suspense around a theme of danger and death. There, then we move into the climax of suspense. And then to the safety and the happy ever after ending. It's a classic. It's an incredible book. I'm surprised that no film producer has not done something. I believe Barbara Cartman wrote a book about something regarding Esther. Now the story is set around 486 BC. But I like to say before Jesus. It's set about 486 before Jesus. And the book of Esther and Daniel are written at the same time and written within the same territory. So we're starting to get a picture of what's going on. The king's wife, Queen Vashti, says no to the king. How dare she? <laughs> How dare the woman who I married say no to me? Is what he's thinking. That's what's operating within him. The story builds towards tension and danger in chapter 1 to 5, and then the blessing of deliverance in 6 to 10. And Susa was where the royal throne was and the palace or the citadel. And a citadel is a fortress that commands a city. And it's used to control the inhabitants of the city, as well as a defence when you're under attack and in a siege. And when 
the king, any king, comes and sits on the throne, it's like he is going to his office to exercise his authority. See all these little subplots that you could take the, 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 the film towards. Now the story starts at a, a, a pompous parade of strength and might. This is his insecurity coming out. The king uh, parades his incredible army to celebrate, listen to this, a forthcoming victory over the Greeks. He has his incredible parade to celebrate the victory over his enemy, the Greeks. Not one of them was dead yet. He's already celebrating. The king had created a vast empire and it was from India to Ethiopia with 127 provinces. And, and the king had only been in power for three years. And this king calls this great celebration banquet and anyone who was anyone was there. This celebration banquet, bank, 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 banquet was in anticipation of this victory over the Greeks. Having displayed his vast army for 180 days. 180 days. The king celebrates for 180 days. He then moves into a time of seven days partying. And Phil described it. Everything was glamorous in the castle. Everything about the celebration was a dedication of an anticipated victory. You know, the food, the wine, the gold cups, the purple, the purple drapes. It was like a seven-day drunken orgy. And the definition of an orgy, I never actually realised what an orgy was, to be honest, never having gone to any. Um, <laughs> So, so I thought I'd just better check out and find out what an, what an audio, because we can sometimes assume things without realising it. Uh, you know, people tell us, but we, you know, we don't know. So it, this is the definition. A wild gathering marked by promiscuous sexual activity and excessive drinking. And I don't know whether they did the first bit, but they most certainly did the second bit. As the people began to throw off their restraint, as they became intoxicated with alcohol, drinking it for seven days, as they had given themselves over to the spirit of intoxication, it began to control them. And for seven days, they go through this process. Now, at the end of the celebration on the seventh day, when the king, seven days, was merry with wine, this king is as drunk as a skunk. <laughs> In his state of drunkenness, he initiates his servants to bring Queen Vashti to dance for them all. Now you imagine being Vashti. She, she's a young woman, she's beautiful. And all, all of these men have been drinking for seven days. They've been parading themselves for 180 days. And this young girl, this young queen, is told by the king, <coughs> come into this environment and dance for us. I wonder if that had been you, what would you have said? It is very unwise, very unwise to act when you are not in control of yourself. It is very unwise. You see, the initiation of this problem wasn't the fact that Queen Vashti said no. It was the fact that the king 
had asked an unreasonable thing to his, from his wife. And he was motivated by the insecurity that represented his character. And then toppled with the, the breastness of being filled with drink. And everybody who gets drunk gets bold and courageous. There's this kind of, he's created this problem. He's created this situation for Vashti. Now he tells the eunuch, and the eunuch is someone who, the eunuch, so someone who looked after the harem. So the king had many wives, and he just chose as he, as he willed. And the eunuch looked after, and so the king tells the eunuch, go and tell her to come. The king wants to show off the queen to the soldiers and all the important guests. Just how beautiful she was. You can see the, the need to be um, shining his badge and saying, look, I'm an, I'm, I'm an important person. But the, but the queen refuses to come. Why did she do this? She was scared. I would be scared. <coughs> Start dancing in front of all those men. He became angry at the king. And you notice as we go through the story, he has a bit of a temper. He's got a few anger management problems. <laughs> he needs some counselling. Remember, I said this in the week on the reading the red, the journey to murder, you know, long before the knife goes into the flesh, the journey to murder starts, says Jesus. And anger is the first part of that journey, the desire to destroy someone else. Why was the king so angry? It was because he was humiliated. And the very thing that he attempts to accomplish had broken down because his wife said no. So the king, he refers the problem to his wife's counsellors. Seven princes, those who understood the times. So even in them days, there was a need to understand, understand the times. People who knew the law of the Medes and the Persians. And one thing you need to know about the, more, the law of the Medes and the Persians is that once it was penned, it could not be undone. And that's why Daniel went into the lion's den. It could never, a law could never be undone. It could be superseded, but it couldn't be undone. And so, once the, so you've got the people there who make the law, people who knew the law of the Medes and the Persians. And the king, he wants to know... What are we going to do with Vashti, Queen Vashti? What are we going to do? What do we do with a wife that won't obey you? So the king inquires as to whether or not there was already a law within the Medes and the Persians to resolve the problem that occurred as a result of her saying no to him. A law in place already to safeguard the potential danger of this experience, to deal with this type of rebellious wife, Queen Vashti. But if not, then we're gonna make one. So they found there was no law, and that's what they did. They make a law to solve a problem. Why do we have rules? Why do we have laws? Queen Vashti's crime was she did not obey the king who had instructed her to dance in the presence of nobility. He was not used to not being obeyed. After all, anyone who was anyone was at the banquet. And he's feeling absolutely humiliated. So the king is trying to recover face trying to resolve the embarrassment that he feels as a result of what Vashti has done. He is humiliated 
and he wants to remove his humiliation by acting against his wife. I ask myself the question, would it have made a difference if it was just them two? You know, he'd asked her for her to dance around the bedroom, you know. Would it have made a difference if it was just the king? It's an interesting one. I think no. He still would have got angry with her and acted against her rebellion. I think he still would have implemented the process because of who he was. But then I think, well, yes, because it is true that his humiliation would have been less. And so maybe he would have been able to take hold of himself and do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. So it's a yes and a no in the answer. The wise men of the kingdom saw the potential danger in her rebellion that could arise throughout the kingdom. Were they right? Just because Queen Vashti had said no in a position of a queen of authority, would all women from that point on say no to their husbands? That's what they're fearing. That's what they're anticipating. I mean, you can see these actors having a great time producing this film. Would they, would this spread like gangrene throughout the kingdom? Were they right? Would all wives become rebellious? They said everyone will see Queen Vashti's conduct as an example and use it as an excuse to do the same. Bring in contempt on all marital relationships. So they're dreading the possibility that they're going to end up with a wife who says no. They just needed to wait a few thousand years. <laughs> was it likely, was it likely that all women all through the, the provinces of the 127 provinces, would they have all said no? This is just a, you know, the Queen didn't want to dance because the circumstances, but nevertheless, they, they, they had convinced themselves that there was a problem and they were going to solve it. And they were going to solve it by producing a law to bring about a transformation in regards to what they're going to do with Queen Vashti. But you can't control people like that. And you can't control people with laws. You can make laws, but the reality of that rebellion you're not going to control with a law. But it's true to say that when a leader falls, it does set a precedent of behaviour because the standard which was high has now dropped. And even in our own history, we've got a dear friend, uh, King Henry VIII, and his desire to be divorced from Catherine and then the establishing of the Church of England and everything that has come since then. So, you know, in the Catholic Church, I don't know if it's still true or not, but whether they're allowed to get divorced or not, but anyway. Um, but, but, you know, the Church of England, yeah, we we'll let that happen because the king did it. And so there's this kind of diminishing of the standards. But the king had instructed her but she did not dance. The wise men instructed the king, but we need to remember, just because wise men instruct a king, it doesn't mean to say that he has to follow their instructions. A secure king, a secure leader, will take counsel, but make the decision. And that's the anointing on them to act. It may not be the general consensus, but the responsibility of a leader, especially in the kingdom of God, in the church, has to be under God first, with the support of those who God places around him, and a consensus of unity. But at the end of the day, that leader has to act according to what he believes or she believes God is saying. I wonder how different the church would be if people who were leading the church would start to act according to the conviction of their hearts before God. 
but she would not dance for him. The king doesn't have to accept what they say. But they know, these wise men, that trouble awaits them. And so they say, if we don't act against Queen Vashti, we, we're going to be in trouble. So we need to nip this contentment in the bud. The fear of the anticipated rebellious women roaming the 127 provinces was petrifying even an army that paraded itself for 180 days. <laughs> and so they say, let us make a decree, a law, so that we can control this kind of behaviour in the future. I wonder when they scrub that law out. Until, I say, until someone else comes along and makes another law to imprison people in a different way. You see, because laws and rules, they imprison people. Are there good laws? Yes, of course there's good laws. Are there bad laws? Yes, there are bad laws. There are. As Christians, what laws should we obey in the land? And you know, that problem is going to occur more and more and more as Christianity becomes a minority rep representation in the land. That's going to become a bigger, bigger problem to Christians. Do you remember the song, Come, 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 chameleon? Are we going to become <coughs> merged into a society or are we going to stand in a different way. The safeguard for us as Christians is a, is a term that we read in the Bible, it says this, we need to obey the law in the Lord. And that representation of in the Lord is according to the will, purpose, plans of God, the ways of God. And when the, the land we live in starts to make us do things that are contrary to the will and ways of the Lord, we are going to be faced with the deep, difficult question, what will we do in these days? And then that applies to so many things, but I kind of time to develop that. So it, the term in the Lord is our safeguard to help us make right decisions in our dealings with those things going on in the law. The Lord judgment that was on Queen Vesti is that she can't ever see the king's face again. Now for some wives that might well be a, a positive move. <laughs> She will lose her royal position and is no longer queen. They give her crown to another more deserving who will respect the crown and honour the king. This new queen will do what the king says so that all men, listen to his brothers and sisters, all men can be masters of their own homes. What? <laughs> what? What? Men be masters of their own homes. What? But it's funny how that's still in our identity. And when we live in this world of uncertainty about the gender reality, the identity in gender, the identity in role, the ident you can see that this book is a, a topical book, it's a book that's appropriate for these days because it's going to answer and deal with lots of questions and issues that we are facing in these days. Let this new decree go everywhere throughout the provinces. As a result, 
of this decree, all women will act right by obeying their husbands, whether great or small. The king is happy to consent with these suggestions from the wise men and make them a new law of the Medes and the Persians. They're not going to be written out. And letters went out of 127 provinces to deal with this problem throughout the empire, from India to Ethiopia. And all these women received all of these revelations. We will force all women to honour their husbands. And I ask, can you force someone to respect and honour someone else? You might well honour and respect from a presentation. But you don't get honour and respect when you take away someone's freedom to honour and respect you. You don't get it. Um, that's why Ephesians talks about uh, um, husbands love your wives. But then it says wives, it doesn't say love your husbands, it says wives respect your husbands. <clears throat> why does it do that? It does that because when a husband loves a wife, the counter response is respect. What does a woman want? She wants to be secure. She wants to be safe. She wants to be held. She wants to be loved. She wants to be protected. She wants to, to work together in the way forward. And when you love a woman in that way, the respect and the honour is, is, is a byproduct. But we live in a world of filled with selfish people who have got themselves all confused about what they should and shouldn't be and do and say and not say and give and the roles and it's all gone chaotic. And it was never meant to be like that. But you can't make someone honour and respect you. The wise men decree to the Queen Vashti. They say, her actions hasn't only created a problem for you, King, but it's created a problem for all men. This contempt she has shown will spread throughout the kingdom. And it's interesting, just to go back a bit, and say that Queen Vashti, at the same time that the King was having his seven-day party, she too was having a party banquet with the women in the castle, separate from the king. I wonder why. Maybe next week we'll find out. Robert, come in. Brilliant, brilliant. Morning, morning um, guys on Zoom. And uh, everybody, it's good to... Good to be here as always, and uh, thanks for Paul for that. Uh, we'll just pray, eh? Father God, I we'll just look forward to this uh, new series of getting to know more about your word, and um, thank you for all these characters that are in this book, that uh, so much I can see already how it's going to reveal so many things for us as we journey through this book of Esther, and then thank you for the the incredible journey, as Paul mentioned, that the Jewish nation have been on through through all history. And uh, Father, we've heard a lot this morning about this particular character, this king, um, who's so worldly and uh, so so earthly minded. But uh, we know that you, Lord, are the one true king. Yeah. And. Um, as Paul was, was speaking, Lord, I, I, I just happened to see a prayer. just want to read this because it, it's entitled The Greatness of God. And he says, Father, we come to praise you just because you are so very great and wonderful. Your power is complete and there is no weakness in you. There's so much weakness in us. There's so much weakness in King Exercise, but there is no weakness 
in you. There is nothing you do not know. And we praise you that everything you see to the ends of the earth and deep into our lives. Father, it's when we become aware of your majesty that we realise how small our lives are. It's when we begin to grasp your glory that we can be held by your grace. So thank you, Lord, for your grace that you show us your mercies, as has been said already this morning, that are new every morning. And, uh, yeah, thank you for the journey that we're about to go on with, uh, with Paul and Esther. <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, coffee and uh, tea will be served. Uh,